Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast, and welcome to 2023, at least in the podcasting world. Uh, we're about half the way through the month uh, on that, but it's been about a month or more since we've gathered together to record, so I'm very happy that we're getting back on the horse and getting geared back up here after the holidays. I'm happy to be joined by a good cross-section of the team here, so I'll just go around my screen really quick and say hi to everybody and let them say a quick word so you can recognize their voices again, and then we're going to jump right into this episode because while it will be a sync level episode for you. We're doing a twofer recording, so we're uh, we're going to knock this out here pretty quick. Uh, I have to start at the upper left, and it's not just because, you know, she carries my DNA. That's my daughter, Alexis. How you doing, Lex? And she's muted, or she's something, or she can't hear me, and so we'll jump on quickly to Mr. Eric Rush. How are you, Eric? I'm good, Don. Good, good to be back. It's been a couple of months. It has been a while. Got Eric, got Robert Koshu here on the screen. Robert, how you doing? Good. Glad to be back, everybody. Yeah. Lex, can you hear us now? I think I figured out the problem. Hey, there we go. It's good to have a I was on the wrong mic feed. Yeah, it's been a know, while, guys. Yeah, yeah, technology is technology. And finally, le- uh, last but certainly not least, that would be Eric Darling Bond. I'm just going to start calling him Eric DB for short. That That's going to be my, uh, until I come up with a better, like, rapper name for him. We have to work on that we have to work on eric's rapper name uh, i mean don forward. you can always just actually eric I'm a, darling bond there but. you go <laughs> yeah p- people who don't understand might not understand and that's what i'm worried about there but uh we'll get into that actually eric is the suggester of today's topic so i'm gonna i'm gonna pass it over to you eric to get us rolling here as we not only go back in time we're gonna do something we're gonna try to do more of which is go to a part of the world we don't frequent very often so uh i'm excited about doing this episode for that reason so uh Oh, my darling Bond, take it away. Well, very kindly. All right, everybody. So I want to ask everybody just a quick question. What is the point of government? Like, we're all just trying to figure out a system that works and it just goes on forever, right? That's the plan. Well, let's that talk be about... the idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. I mean... It's raining in Arizona, so I might just be having an existential crisis, but I thought what a perfect way to talk about the history of Christianity in Japan. Mostly, it's going to center around the Shimabara Rebellion in 1637, but before we get into that, we're going to need to do a little background. Don't worry, it won't be entirely boring. I've made a quiz. (laughs) So... The arrival of Christianity can be roughly estimated as 1549, six years after Portuguese sailors first initiated contact with coastal daimyos. Those are the regional warlords uh, or heads of their domains in about 1543. Now, while this section will be largely about Catholicism and its response to the Japanese, it is important we bear in mind the economic benefits of foreign trade and how that spurred interest and, dare I say, indulgence of a foreign religion among the establishment. Which brings us to our first question. You thought you were safe, but I got a question. (laughs) Who spearheaded the evangelization of Japan? We have A, the Franciscans, B, the Lazarus, C, the Anglicans, or D, Jesuits? Let's start with Alexis. Alexis, do you have an answer? I'm going D, Jesuits. You are going D with Jesuits. Don. That was going to be my guess too, but I feel like I got to just shake things up. So I'm going to go, uh, I know I know it's on Anglicans. I'm going to go B, whatever B was. I don't even remember what B was, but I'm going to go B. You're going to go with the Lazarus. Understood. Eric Rush. I'm going to go Jesuits and specifically uh, Francis Xavier. Oh, going with Francis Xavier. Somebody saw the script. Robert, uh, not Francis- bearing what I just said. What was your first note? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I actually, I, I will admit, I'm, I've been, I've been totally lazy and I didn't look at the script. So, that's no, A. <laughs> I'm going with A. 
just because I'm going to be a little different too. You're going to be the Franciscans. Well, Franciscans. it was indeed the Jesuits. Good job, Eric Russian Alexis. Coming out of that sweet counter reformation, the Society of Jesus was founded on the ideals and teachings of Saint Ignatius of Loyola. Loyola. Am I saying that right, Eric? Loyola. 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 They emphasized a commitment to service, poverty, and education. Even today, their universities are renowned in both religious and secular education circles. They quickly earned the patronage of the Kingdom of Portugal under King Yeal III. I am going to call him King John because, unfortunately, my mastery of Portuguese only extends to mouthing along with love, actually, so we're, we're going to keep going now. One of the original seven priests to join the order was Francisco of Javier, or as Eric correctly pointed out, St. Francis Xavier. Francis would be intrinsic to the spreading of the reach of the church into India, China, the Moluccas, anywhere the Pope said was within the realm of Portuguese influence. Evangelization was not, however, his primary mission. Second question, what was his primary mission? A, to bring the Portuguese settlers back into Christian orthodoxy. B, to preside over animal trials within the colonies. C, to police new converts within the colonies. Or D, to spy on the Portuguese for the Papal States. Alexis, what is your answer? I'm between two. I'm going to say C. To police new converts within the colonies? Yeah. All right. Don? I'm going to go D, because I couldn't go D last time, so I'm going to go D this time. Okay. Spy on the Portuguese for the Papal States. Eric Rush? I'm going to go C. C, police new converts within the colonies. And Robert? I'll be with C as well. Unfortunately, everyone was incorrect. <laughs> Francis was sent first to India by King John III to police the Portuguese settlers, who were described by no less of an authority than the founder director of the Xavier Center of Historical Research, Teotono de Souza. The great majority of those who were dispatched as discoverers were the riffraff of Portuguese society, picked up from Portuguese jails. End quote. So criminals, soldiers, and unpopular nobles. The history of colonization in a nutshell, Francis was deemed a necessity by what clergy were present in the colony, as many settlers were marrying locals and adopting the customs of the Indians. So Hinduism, Buddhism, and among other practices, which they thought was not cool. <clears throat> Now, Francis, believing the best defense was a good offense, began to encourage efforts to aggressively convert the locals and use the threat of inquisition to keep practitioners in line. Don't forget, Portugal's neighbor and best frenemy, Spain, had already been in a state of inquisition for 100 years now. And that won't end until the 1860s. Going on. Some practitioners who needed the crook were the sailors profiting off the non-bond trade. This could be considered the triangle trade of the Far East. Sailors would go to Goa in India, to Malacca, which is in Malaysia, to the islands Ternay and Tidor in Indonesia, to Manila in the Philippines, to Macau in China, and then to Nagasaki in Japan. So if we go with the ports, that's seven... So we would call that the heptagon trade. It'll catch on, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Better, it, be, be, better living through geometry, please. <laughs> yeah. Keep it at a triangle. Triang everybody loves triangles. It was certainly a beneficial relationship as the Portuguese traders brought, Jap uh, brought to Japan matchlock weapons and access to Ming era Chinese products like silk. Meanwhile, the Japanese provided precious silver and slaves. Now, Japanese slaves typically were peasant farmers who were sold by their daimyos for profit or by their own family members to avoid starvation. It is never a great thing to find out you are the least favored member of your family, but there was a market for Japanese slaves. Or was there? So, your next question. 
Just how popular were Japanese slaves? A, they were a brief fad among European nobility, but were too expensive to keep importing. B, Pope Paul III was horrified to receive a gift of slaves from King John III of Portugal, who was called the Pious, in 1550, and excommunicated him immediately. C, slaves are recorded as owning Japanese slaves. D, nobody wanted them as the Japanese were considered a civilized culture. Alexis. I'm going C. You are going with C, okay. Don? I'm gonna go with C as well. You are also going with C as well. Eric Rush. I'm gonna go with A. You're gonna go with A, they were a brief fad. And Robert Koshu. I'm thinking A as well. You're going with A. Well, congratulations, Don and Alexis. You got the point. I do have to say though, uh, whatever I pick, there's at least one other person that's picking my other answer, so it's making me feel good if I don't get it right. <laughs> yes. Ah, but yes, we have records of European and African slaves buying Japanese slaves, because we're in that weird part of history where indentured servitude and chattel slavery are just about to develop along racial categories. This is largely the result of slaves coming from afar rather than someone your war band caught in a village they torched 50 miles from your castle. Keep this in mind as we go on, it might be important. Francis Xavier had the desire to preach in Japan, but needed an inn, which in 1547 came with a man named Anjiro. Anjiro was a samurai retainer for a local Shimasu clan in the southernmost island of Kyushu. The, so, as we know, Japan is an archipelago comprised of many islands. The second largest island and the one that we see at the southernmost center is Kyushu. Now, back then, samurai affiliated with daimyo, daimyo were licensed to kill any commoner that had insulted them, so long as they met the rules. One, they needed a witness to vouch for an insult. Two, they needed it to be immediately. You can't just be having staircase thoughts and think, I should have killed that guy. I'm going to go back and kill that guy. <laughs> now, whether he didn't have a witness or he had waited too long or it was, a, it was not a poor person, Anjiro was on the run for murder very quickly. Very drunk, he showed up at the docks of Nagasaki and was trying to find somewhere to disappear. The presumably bewildered Portuguese captain, Alvaro Vaz, Anjero was confessing to, felt that he would be a great member of the crew. Come back tomorrow and we'll start you on your new job, you runaway murderer. Welcome to the team. The next day, Anjero came back to the dock and he walked on to an entirely different ship by mistake. Thankfully, Captain Jorge Alvarez thought Andro didn't need a job. He needed a priest. So they left to meet up with his pal, Francis Xavier, in Malacca. When they arrived, Francis Xavier wasn't there. He was on the far side of Malaysia, trying to preach in the Molkas. But Andro, before he could leave, saw Francis Xavier from the, dark, from the dock waving his arms because a storm had prevented him from actually leaving, and he had come back. So, Anjiro became the first baptized Japanese person under the name of Paulo de Santa Fe. There was just a slight problem. Anjiro might not have entirely understood what Christianity was at first, and Francis Xavier might not have entirely understood Japan. So, where did the confusion come in? A. Anjiro thought the Christians were a Buddhist sect because they had just come from India, where all the Buddhists live. B. There wasn't a direct one-to-one -one correlation between the Abrahamic conception of God and the Shinto Buddhist conception of Kami. C. Francis thought the Shimaihusu Daimyo was the king of Japan when there was already an emperor and a shogun. D, Francis and the Portuguese kept calling Japan the wrong name. Alexis, what is your answer? Go on B. 
You're going with B. Okay, Don? I'm going to take founder's prerogative and go with E, all of the above, because they all sound possible. They all sound possible. Okay. Eric? I'm going to go C. C? And Robert? Oh, this is the one where everyone's different. I'm going A. You're going A? All of these were reasons for confusion. Don figured it out. <laughs> And this won't be a one-time issue. This will be a repeated complication that keeps showing up through the efforts to evangelize. <laughs> to the credit of Francis Xavier, he at least brought the daimyo Shimatsu Takehisa a nice gift. Initially, the meeting went well, everything was friendly, and he even gave them permission to preach <laughs> their sect out in the open. But then when they figured out, oh, you guys aren't Buddhists, <laughs> About a year later, the Buddhist in the town got mad and asked them to leave, which he went along with. So Christianity had been outlawed by the first official region that they got into contact with. This kind of leads to the mission falling apart in slow motion. This is not to say there weren't any successes. Despite early struggles, one local daimyo, Amora Surtamata, had converted alongside his heir. The newly da christened Dom Bartholomew gave the Jesuits a small fishing village named Nagasaki, and they soon started making a nice profit charging import duties. They are not allowed to charge import duties, but to the Jesuits, they really needed to fund their operation because the king of Portugal might have been a tiny bit broke. Francis was able to learn Japanese eventually, despite the profound difference between the languages. He worked to iron out the theological lexical gaps between Catholic Christianity, Shintoism, and Buddhism. Because, like I said before, there are just some words that don't translate. And eventually, in 1552, Francis Xavier was reassigned to China. He died there very shortly afterwards, and Anjiro was left in charge of his own mission in Japan. Uh, unfortunately, the priests kind of mutinied against him because they didn't think a local Japanese person knew enough about Christianity to preach. Then he got run out of town by his former boss. And then he died becoming a pirate raiding in, Japan, uh, in China. So that's quite a life. But ultimately, this would lead to a new successor who would kind of learn from the missteps of this first mission, Alessandro uh, Valignano, kind of a, they crawled so he could run. Now, we've talked a lot about how the Portuguese missionaries viewed the Japanese, but let's talk about the Japanese perspective. What did they think of all these people just kind of showing up out of the blue? Well, the Japanese first met the Portuguese in 1543 when a trade galleon arrived off the shore of Kagoshima, which is also in the vicinity of Kyushu, where Anjiro was from. You see, it's all coming together very slowly. The Portuguese had heard of Japan through their contacts in China, and the Japanese had heard about the Portuguese, but they thought they were Oni. What are Oni? They are, are they A, gods, B, troll-like demons, C, merpeople, D, bicycle enthusiasts? I, I want to go, I want to go for, can, can I get a combination of B and C? You cannot, it's one or two. <laughs> I'm going to go with B. You're going to go with B, troll-like demons. Alexis. A2, B. Okay, we got another B. Eric Rush, merpeople, gods, troll-like demons, or bicycle fiends? Mm, I really wanted to be merpeople, so I'm going to go with, is that C? That is C. I'm going C then, because I really want that to be true. <laughs> All right, they come from uh, the sea, they and, must be mer people. And, and by the uh, way, it's an alternate history podcast, Eric. We can make it true, by golly, if we <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going A, knowing how Shintoism works. Okay, you're going with gods. Yes. Okay, well, good news. For Donna and Alexis, you got it completely right. They thought they were troll demons. 
I just have to say, shout out, thank you, Lore Podcast by Aaron Minky. I think that's why I got the answer right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you did an episode on that at some point, because I was like, I know I've heard this before. Yeah. So typically Oni were depicted as ugly giants with red or blonde wild hair, which is exactly what the five foot five Portuguese sailors looked like to the on average five foot Japanese local. Horribly ugly, but in a way you couldn't help but stare. As Japan had been isolated from local trade due to the actions of Japanese pirates, there was quite a demand for Chinese good like porcelain and silk. For their part, the Japanese were able to export silver and art style. In fact, it became kind of a dominant fad in European art for the next 200 years was, hey, do you want us to Japanese it up? I didn't say it was great, but you know, it was a thing. And silver <laughs> and slaves, which would quickly become a sticking point for the diplomatic relationship. But no effort was really made by the Japanese central government for about 44 years, so 1587. The practice was banned in Portugal in 1595 because they were afraid it would endanger conversion efforts if they were actively trying to enslave people. But why didn't the central government do anything before? A, there was no central government in Japan to intervene. B, the shogun thought slavery was a Christian religious practice and didn't want to offend them. C, daimyo could write off slaves as a business expense on taxes. D, if we got rid of all the poor people, everybody else is rich. Alexis, what is your thought? Go and see. You're going with C. Daimyo could write off slaves as a business expense. Don. Uh, that that would be a modern justification, so I'm not going to go there. I'm 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 going to go with uh, I'm going to go with the lack of a central authority in the true sense. Okay. Was a... So they have no government to speak of. Eric Rush. I'm also going to go with Don. Go A. No, no central government to speak of. Okay, and Robert. I'm staying with the central government. Yeah, or no central government. Because they were still feudal warlords at that point. (laughs) That is correct, Robert. There was no central government. Since 1467, the archipelago had been embroiled in a civil war. Each clan's head was competing to be made the shogun or lord protector of Japan. This position was originally ceremonial, sort of a war chief for the emperor's armies. Kind of like Oh, you know, that one old guy there, he's been here a long time. Let's make him the war chief. Kind of like the president pro tempore of the Senate. We just kind of give that to the oldest person there. Certainly feels that way sometimes, but, you know, that's my own opinion. (laughs) But you know how the song goes. As time goes by, the position becomes hereditary, and then someone actually gets power doing it. And finally, it becomes the real power behind the throne in the 12th century. So this meant the Jesuits and other missionary groups like the Franciscans, who were now on the scene, had to appeal to individual daimyos for their protection. Unfortunately, the priestly orders did not seem to be on the same page. What did the Jesuits and Franciscans disagree on? A, if the Japanese should end their acceptance of homosexual relationships. B, whether the Japanese should be recruited for the priesthood. C if priests should try to learn Japanese, D, if priests should make sweet, sweet money, E, if if their converts should destroy shrines and temples, and then F, if the Japanese should end the taking of concubines in addition to a wife. So remember, this is the thing they disagreed about, meaning everything else they agreed on. It's just this one thing. Alexis, what do you think they couldn't agree on? Yeah, I'm between multiple again. Ugh. Um, It was the first thing that stuck in, my, stuck in my head, so I'm going C. You're going C, whether or not they should learn Japanese at all. Yeah. 
Okay. Don, what's your thought? I was leaning there too with a, uh, if I were able to mark a secondary answer would have been the destruction of, of local shrines, but I'm going to go with the language thing. You're going to go with the language thing. Okay. Eric Rush, what's your thought? I'm going to go B. They disagreed on whether Japanese should be priests. They disagreed on whether Japanese should be priests. Okay. Robert. D. You're going with D, if priests should make that sweet, sweet coin. All right. Well, Don and Alexis, you got it again. The father-daughter dream team is at it. The Portuguese backed Jesuits under Alessandro felt they should be trying to integrate with the culture by learning about it and the language. In fact, a Jesuit had to study Japanese for two years before being assigned a post. The Spanish-backed Franciscans thought it was a waste of time. To be frank, neither order was impressive to the locals, especially given how much these southern barbarians, that's what Nanban means when they say the Nanban trade. They were saying the southern barbarian stuff that they bring us. Uh, how much, especially given how much these southern barbarians despise the culture of the people they were supposedly here to save. So you see, Japan, though lacking a centralized government, had a fairly rigid caste system. Or it did before this 150-year-long civil war. Imagine the longest fight you've ever had with someone, and then imagine that going for 150 years. The shogun was the supreme political authority. The emperor, or sometimes empress, was kind of the divine figurehead who was uh, directly descended from Amaterasu, the sun god, and they would grant legitimacy. Then you had your daimyos in charge of their domains, samurai who were the military backbone, kind of like knights in feudal Europe. Then you had ronin who were samurai who weren't attached and just kind of killing people for fun. Uh, then you had peasant farmers who worked the land, artisans under them. And then lastly, were the tradesmen, <clears throat> or sorry, were merchants, because they didn't really make anything. They just kind of sold other people's stuff, and that was seen as kind of treacherous by the Japanese. But I'm not going to talk more about that, because I just rent. So, ah. But the Buddhist conception of karma and reincarnation kind of became a handy tool to ignore the plight of the poor since, well, they clearly earned their lot through their previous actions, a.k.a. I was born wealthy for a reason. You know, I will tell a small story. So you know how I grew up in a new age religious household? Mm -hmm. Okay, huh? so my, yeah, I grew up in a UFO cult, Eric. And at one point, my uncle tried telling me when I was about 12, well, Eric, you were born white because you had done good things in your past lives. So naturally, you're born in a place of privilege. I don't talk to that uncle about that anymore. Anywho, let's keep going. So this was all in contrast with how Christianity was used and seen by the powerful in Europe who were wealthy because God favored them for their righteousness. We have not quite fixed this problem yet on either side. Anywho, there were a number of spiritual pitfalls that made potential converts kind of weary of the new faith. To many, Buddhism offered a way to enlightenment that was achievable and consistent. They also had reservations about a god who created good and evil, but was only responsible for the good part, per the very judgmental priests who kept saying their relatives were in hell because they had never heard of Jesus before. I'm not trying to be irreverent towards any faith, just trying to be very frank about how people were talking about it. So don't mean to offend anyone, and please let me know if I do. Okay. Now, there were elements that were very much appealed to converts about Christianity, though. Religiously, I mean, not just getting better deals with the Portuguese because they saw you wear a cross that one time. They aren't Vikings in the day and age, for goodness sakes. Now, what was the chief spiritual appeal of Christianity? Was it A, that the faithful could perform miraculous healings and exorcisms? B, that they would slowly transform into European whites by living as Christians? C, 
that they could have a personal relationship with God, or Deus, as he was called. D, that there was a permanent afterlife for the faithful, Alexis. That, that was my sort of frustration because I'm trying to figure out which one it is. I'm going to say B. Okay, B. Got it. Don. Uh, because she has been right so many times before, I'm just going to keep riding the same train. I'm going to follow Alexis to B. <laughs> All right. And Eric? I'm going to go B as well. D and Robert? I'm, I'm going D. I'll be the odd man out on this one. You're going to be D. That is correct, Robert. It's the fact that it was a permanent afterlife and they thought they were Buddhists initially. So they were trying to get out of this mess by just having a permanent place to go to. Now, we're going to jump ahead. Basically, from this point, what goes on is that they start getting in trouble with the local daimyos once they do become centralized. This leads to a series of persecutions and also a lot of fear that they are suddenly going to bring about an army with them. So can we all roll our die and then I'm going to record your number. Alexis, if you could go first. And I got five. You got a five. Don? Oh, uh, you didn't specify that it had to be a six-sided die. I went and got my uh, got my role-playing die. I could have rolled a d20, but I'm going to go with the three that I rolled on the d6. The roll you... Okay, three. Eric? Got a four. A four. And then Robert? I got a six. You got a six. Well, Don, you tricky... <laughs> Duck, you almost got it right. I made it purposefully that all of you would end up as peasants unless you had used the D20. So good freaking job, Don. But it didn't help because you thought I was playing fair, but there's nothing fair about a caste system. So let's talk about a hundred years off from this. Congratulations, you are all peasants. You only have one name. You are forced to register at a local Buddhist temple. And you have to grow rice because rice is the currency and what people tax with. Also, you can't eat it unless you want to be murdered. Also, we're also in the time of the Little Ice Age, so food is even more sparse than usual. But guess what? As long as your local daimyo hasn't told the shogun that he can produce twice the amount of rice that's actually possible, You'll be a-okay. Guess what? He did exactly that, because the more rice he produced, the more troops he get, and your daimyo wants to invade the Philippines. Why? I don't know. It just seems like a really good idea to him. This is the position we find the Shimabara rebels. Basically, it kind of turned into a peasant uprising that became a Christian uprising. The Christians found themselves uh, embarked at Shimabara Castle, which was the former castle used by the previous landlords who were Christians, but then got displaced due to backing the wrong horse in the Civil War, which is rule one of any Civil War you might find yourselves in. And they were able to hold out for a good four months before unfortunately falling to the army. However, in this period, for 252 years, Christianity would still be persecuted. There would be no relationship outside of Japan, except with the Dutch, who helped uh, take down the rebellion, but didn't kill anybody. They just kind of fired a gunboat at the Christian rebels, and they felt a little guilty because they were Christian, but not so much because they were Catholic, and they ended up getting killed by one of the sharpshooters. So that went well, but it made them best friends with the Japanese. So I guess, you know, take some, lose some. And that is what we're going to come to today. We are wondering, what if they had live? So basically, they need everything to go right. The main fork I've chosen is that they were repelled at an earlier castle, but if they had gotten into a more better stocked position, they would have been able to hold out longer and create chaos. The leader of the rebellion was a 16-year-old named Amakusa Shiro. That means he's from Amakusa and he's the fourth son. 
He also said to everybody that his name was Geronimo because that's what he had been baptized as. I know that just means his name was Jerome, but he said it was Geronimo. Geron Geronimo. And later, by the end, he said, it's Francisco, call me Francisco. So let's suppose everything had gone well. The government of the shogunate is basically in tatters because they could not crush down this rebellion. And a 16-year-old boy bandit king is in charge of the southernmost island. Now, what I suggested was he needs to produce an heir. He needs to be crowned. But he's not going to find any priests on the island because they're either in hiding, dead, or too old to be of any use. He can try going to the Philippines, but there's nobody there charged with administering a crowning because this is also the time of the 40 years war in Europe, 30 years war in Europe, and the restoration war between the Portuguese and the uh, Spanish. So what are we going to do here, gang? Now, I am going to give the first choice between Alexis and Don, since you both score five points on the system. Does but he... I'm a, but I'm a, mere, I'm a mere three peasant, so I don't know how, how that modifies my score. So uh... <laughs> It doesn't really, but you know what? We can make it happen. This is the <laughs> alternate history podcast of Fork in Time. Right. Let's do it. So he has to establish himself as a king. Odds are he's probably going to declare himself the emperor of Japan. Maybe. <laughs> it basically ends up that he can control this southernmost island and defend it with a limited population and just hold out for as long as he can. But this creates kind of a two Japanese islands, both calling themselves Japan or Nihon as they would have actually called themselves. Yeah, and when I when I went to do some research on this, because I will readily admit that my my Asian history is, is an area of weakness, and particularly my Japanese and Chinese history are areas of weakness, is um, that was what I started thinking through, was thinking through the geography as much or more than anything else in terms of how easy it would have been to have isolation inside of the, you know, because they're islands. And... Uh, and, and just how that would play itself out. And of course, you know, in the real timeline, uh, this became, you know, the Dutch gained some exclusivity, exclusivity, exclusivity. I can't say it, but they got it uh, when it came to trade and uh, that they prospered from that while other, other powers, Portugal and others, you know, uh, paid the price for it until there was the general opening up and, you know, uh, Commodore Perry and the others coming in the middle of the 19th century to change that. And, you know, where I went, all the way down the path is, you know, to your point there, you know, do you have the establishment of, you know, something like uh, the Meiji Restoration, you know, hundreds of years earlier or more centralized type of thing was where I went, you know, is um, I think you could have had a, a two path Japan uh, for all the reasons you've described there, the geography playing to that. And then now, yeah, I was, was I really thought down the extent of the fork here was, you know, what does that set up in terms of what we think of as being 20th century Japan? Because that is so steeped in how you got there, uh, both, you know, from a, from a cultural standpoint, but also from that isolation. And then, you know, the way that I, the way that I think of 20th century Japan is playing catch up. And when they start playing catch up, they start playing catch up in a major way. And so if you have less of that needing to happen and you have a some substantial portion of uh, you know what we think of as being uh, as being Japan today being separate, you know how does that play forward? That, that's just that's very broad sweep, but to your first point, I think yeah, I, I think you would have to establish if you're going to be a 16 year old leader, you've got to find some legitimacy somewhere, and do you want that to be legitimacy that's been established because of those that have come in that are foreigners that have brought a religion with them, even if you're an adherent to it. And, and it's and you're bringing up an interesting point, Don. And I would I would add to that is is do we do we think that this movement would would extend to the entire island of Kyushu? Um, I mean, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Or does this become you know a local enclave? Has become you know and and for different reasons in in some ways, but this could become a a little bit of an enclave like a like a Hong Kong or a Macau. That's exactly what I had in my head. Is 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 this a different version? Is is this a is this a Portuguese version of a a larger version of a Hong Kong? you know, that we would be dealing with today and, and not obviously inside of China, but inside of Japan, what right. Japan would have become. 
Well, right. well, and I think one of the most challenging difficulties is if we are relying very heavily on that Portuguese influence, well, before the Portuguese could unite with the Spanish crowns, they were required to expel all of their Jews and Muslims. Now, before they, they kind of put out the order, but then they just announced, you're all Christians. So I, <clears throat> based on that kind of influence, and this is that same generation that has been laying the groundwork, I could definitely see it to where the king just says, okay, everybody, you know how we had to register at a local Buddhist temple? We are now registering with a local parish. Well, and, then, and we see that as in the way of just as sort of an administrative act, not necessarily a true forced conversion. Is that what you mean, Eric? Exactly. Just okay. kind of a name. Yeah, you're you're Christian now. Whatever, go do, do go do your thing. That's fine. We don't really care, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do this thing. Yeah. So the and the the second part where this goes me is I'm sitting here thinking through it. So you end up with an open, quote unquote, conclave down in the southern part of Japan, mm -hmm. does that, because of the way this went down, does that make the northern part, what we think of as primary Japan, does that make it even more isolationist when Perry and them come back to where they don't open up? So do, or, 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 do you, or do you even, you know, do you even have the need to send a Perry on that mission if you've already got access to the trade goods that you want to have? And you know, to me, That's to me, the, point. to me, the interesting thing about this is I was, you know, I, I was, I was familiar with the term, but wasn't familiar with the history. Is you know, it's, and, and Eric sort of hit upon this and the questions that he asked us. You know, was this a religious or in the in the background? Was this a, re, a, re, a religious uprising? Yes. What was it mainly though? It was mainly an economic peasant uprising against the situation there, and so. To me, the more fundamental question is how feudal does now the elements of Japan that are different remain? And is there an opportunity for a different, any form of ec different economic system to uh, to come into play? And I couldn't help but go back to I that was episode nine, maybe when Don was flying solo doing doing the Black Death. You know, one of the one of the inputs of the black one of the elements of the Black Death was if you if you lost too many people, it changed the economic leverage. Feudalism was undermined by the fact that there there was um, there was suddenly labor had more value because there was less of it available. And of course, the amazing thing here is the number of people. You know, back to your point about where the fork is, Eric. How many people died before the victory took place, and would that have had an impact on the just the economic structure? You know, that, that, that's thrown out a lot of stuff I know all together there, but that was the other thing I began to wonder is, you know, is the ripple more religious? Is the ripple more governmental or is the ripple more economic or is it somehow all of those things? Do you guys want to hear my very wild pitch for what I thought might happen? Go for it, Eric. Okay. Okay. So you're 16 years old and you have just thrown off an improbable victory against a system that has been in power for about 36 years of stable rule. Before that, totally civil war for 150 years. It's a wild time to be alive. You've tried reaching out to the local diocese in Macau, which you are technically in the same vicinity of, but there has not been a priest there for five years, and there won't be for another 12 years because European wars. So you don't have a priest. You don't have a stable priest. You maybe have local lay people who are not authorized to perform ceremonies, and you have an exclusively dedicated team of peasants, former samurai who are Christians who were displaced from power, and peasants who are also Christians, but maybe just kind of said they were Christians because, you know, everybody was doing it. We were killing that one guy. It was great, you know, but it's wild. I don't really get it. But we're all wearing these cool, fancy white robes, and we've shaved crosses into our heads. We look sick. So you need to make a plan. Step one, you marry yourself to one wife, and then you take a concubine from all of your local comrades to fill out the rest of the, the daimyo. Kyushu means nine states, so that's about nine concubines you have to take. Every child you have with one of them, that will be the descendant who rules that specific community. Meanwhile, the overall head will be you and your primary wife. 
Great plan. Step two, you need to establish a trade relationship with the Dutch who tell you, you know what, it's okay that you're doing your own thing. You don't need a priest to tell you what to do, baby. It's all cool. Just do your own thing. You're the head of your own church. Start a Japanese national church for all we care. You want some guns? You, of course, want guns. And guess what? The people up north, they're having a, a whole schism of their own because they're all disconnected. You are the first legitimate threat, and now you're seeing all these pockets of resistance coming up through the ground. Before you know it, within a decade, you have married the Empress of Japan and have now named yourself the official head honcho of the region. Congratulations. And then the priests show back up. And now you are being investigated under the threat of inquisition because you've done everything they've had a problem with, taking concubines, maybe having relations with other men because as far as you're concerned, like it's okay as long as you have a wife and a kid eventually, you know, and essentially seizing power and making yourself a bishop and you've also called yourself God's messenger. That's a little weird. <laughs> People are starting to think this is a cult. At least that's how we would interpret it in the future, but you don't know about that yet. And lastly, you make the city of Nagasaki your new capital. You decide to name it after Francis Xavier. You also name it after yourself because you've changed your name to Francisco from Geronimo, which also, great call. That's going to be very awkward for American historians in a few hundred years. And now, when people want to see the king of Japan, you go to San Francisco in Kyushu. I actually see that playing out because the Dutch, this is in the middle of, of the Reformation as well, so the Dutch are going to get on board because it's one way to shut down the Catholic influence. Well, right, and, and this is probably, this is not the Dutch government. Well, it is the Dutch government, but it's really the Dutch East India Company, right? Right. Right. And so, you know, so which we're the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's kind of why I backpedal a little bit, but, but there yeah. is, they have an economic interest in wanting to be, you know, I, I like your, <laughs> Erica, like when you say, it's fine, baby, you do whatever you want. Um, because the Dutch East India Company, they don't care as long as they're making money, as long as yeah. they can, as long as they can import stuff, they don't care what you do. That's yeah, why the Dutch of, worked with the Japanese in our own timeline because they made they, them promise we won't try to convert people. Yeah, we won't try to convert you. Got, you got nine concubines, fine. Then we're we're down with that. What do you want? You you want guns? What, we want silver and gold. Maybe uh, slaves. Yeah, and and I was having to 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 look and think, you know, I was trying to match the the timeline over because it's easy to get lost here in you know a couple hundred years and forget where you are. So this is you know much further down the road than the than the start of the Reformation. I mean, we're a century removed yeah. from the start of the Reformation. This is post the Armada, so mm -hmm. Spain is to a great degree in in some ways relative decline. You know, they've had that that massive ascendancy. There's still what's flowing in from from um, from the Western hemisphere to them in terms of, you know, gold and resources, that's still going to run for a little bit more, but you know, that interesting, you were talking about there, Eric, Eric, Eric DB, the, you know, the, the sort of the Portuguese Spanish thing that's going on, you know, at the same time here and remembering that the reason the Portuguese are the, the Christian authority, the Jesuits being there is because the, the Pope has divided the world and said, this part is Spain and this part is Portugal. And I couldn't help but think of one of my favorite movies from the mid eighties, which is the mission, you know, which actually talks about the handover of some of the territory when they redraw the line between the, the Spanish and the Portuguese and the fact that one did permit slavery, the other did not and then the tensions that that created and so imagine you carry that conflict that happened in brazil over to what's happening there in asia just in a different way with a lot more resources that are at play because that's the reason the dutch are there right yeah i wrote a much longer script but i quickly became aware of like i've made this way too long <laughs> hence the jump i will share that on the discord if anybody wants to see the full thing i'd love, I'd love for you to do that eric yeah, but I, when I was discussing with my wife, Grace, about like, I don't know, I don't want to make this dude super creepy just because he's now the new king of like a weird cult. Oh, by the way, Amsham Rikyo, the people who did the sarin gas attacks in the 90s, they came out of Kyushu. So alternate 1990s, they're still around. And they tried hmm. to assassinate the Japanese emperor at his wedding. <laughs> 
it's what that's yes. a whole other episode I'll pitch some later time. Yeah, so, 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 I mean, and I, and I like that we're here and, you know, and, the, and, the, and we're, we're feeling around a lot of the edges of this, but to focus a little bit more, you know, short term, medium term, long term. Yeah. In, in, in the short term there, in, in the real timeline, the Dutch, the Dutch win at the, at the expense of the Portuguese, if you're looking from a European power perspective. And so in the short term, if you just change, not understanding what's going to happen inside of Japan. That's a whole other question, maybe a more difficult question to answer, but just looking at it from, you know, our European centric guys, you know, because that's what we do rightly or wrongly. What difference does that make in terms of changing just that balance of power there in the short term between the Portuguese and the Dutch? Again, we're talking early 17th century here. Well, they are both in the middle of a civil war of their own at this time. Following the Thirty Years' War, the two start breaking up the Iberian Union. They had briefly merged as one political entity. The Pope made the rule like, okay, but it's still got to be Jesuits in charge of what was Portuguese and Spanish in charge of what was the Spanish with the Franciscans. And after the Thirty Years' War being tied in with the Habsburgs, they're both kind of broke and unable to administrate this region. Uh, but to quote my wife, who gave me some advice while writing this out, <clears throat> creepy dudes being creepy is something you can always bet on. <laughs> creepy dudes in power using their power to sleep with young pretty women is a constant throughout time, end quote. Great star. <laughs> I mean, I, I can think of very few counterexamples to that. So I'm, I'm going to say that's, can we call that Grace's axiom? Yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and it's universal through time and through space, right? Right, Eric? So, it certainly yeah, seems to be. I was I trying mean, so hard not to make him Henry VIII, <laughs> but a no. Henry VIII that is arguably more functional. <laughs> but I, was anyway. really, I was literally thinking earlier, I was like, you have no idea how many parallels this actually has with the other topic we're going to be covering. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, you know, I was thinking the same thing. I, all, you know, this all happened, you know, Charles I is, is in, is, 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 is you know, King of England during this, you know, what 1730s or 1637, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're not, we're, we're all, you know, we're, we're stewards, not tutors in this one, like, like we will be in a, in a little while, but um, no, 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 we're stewards still in the, in the other one. Yeah, we're still stewards. So we're, we're staying with the, with the house of Stuart in this, uh, in, in this whole set of podcasts. So, um, but yeah, I was thinking about the parallels there as well. And I, and I guess I still feel like, I don't think anybody's going to be able to administer this. I don't think there's any of your power that's going to be able to administer it. So it'll be self-governing. I still think the Dutch will have more influence. Um, oh, yeah. My thought was that it's basically people who are trying to be Catholic, but there's no authority and there's nobody to make the rules. But they will, they have they the will Dutch drift. There. Yeah. They will drift. They will drift into, into what they remember of Catholicism. They will drift into, you know, Protestantism. The Dutch are, are maybe not necessarily evangelizing, but at least exposing them to, and then probably the Buddhism and Shintoism that they're, that they're familiar with. Or that are the, that are I was going to say it, it, it is a be a blend. Catholicism in Haiti. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. A, yeah. very much like a Haitian Catholicism where it's kind of a voodoo Catholic mix. Yeah. yeah I, I was thinking the exact same thing, you know, having been to Guatemala and other places where there's, you know, for example, Mayan culture influence there that slides in with the Catholic church. It, it's a common thing. And, and you even see it in other parts of, Asia, you know, parts of the things that become the Baha'i faith and and other things like that, you know, where it, it, it draws from local tradition, local, well, I mean, even even Eric D.B. In, in the question, you know, this whole question of what what is God? Well, if you're if you're into ancestor worship, you know, that 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 becomes a trickier part of what goes on there and, and, and there as well. And to, I think it was Eric Rush's point, you know, it's um, it's going to be about the trade. So they're going to be they're going to be willing to let a lot of stuff slide, you know, as long as the spice, literally in this case, as long as the spice flows, they're good, you know, to, oh. to borrow a, to borrow a Frank Herbert thing. I mean, it, it, that's what it's going so to be Japan about. Japan is a ruckus? Uh, you know, if you really want to stretch this, yeah, I haven't yeah. forgot who, haven't forgot who's Maud Deeb in this whole thing, but we've got a 16 year old running around. So, you know, you can go there if you want to. Yeah. Basically all revolutions, when you put them into shapes is a circle. So, Things have changed, but it's taken on a distinctly Japanese flavor. Yeah, yeah. And, and yes, you know, so I'd ask the question. You know, just just trying to trying to to narrow us down a little bit because there's a lot of history, a lot of room to run here. You know, in the short term, I think it obviously does benefit or change the the balance of power with uh, 
uh, the Dutch and the Portuguese. But to me, the more interesting part of this fork in the ripple is, is there still, you know, if Chris Perheri probably tells us, no, it's inevitable, it's all going to come back around, we're going to end up with World War One and World War Two, no matter what we do, we can't avoid it. But uh, is this idea of, could you have a different Japanese culture that's impacted enough by this earlier injection of Christianity that you don't see the same type of culture is the only place I know to go. The culture that that sets up the the Japan that we know, uh, you know, from the from the middle nineteenth century on, but particularly you know coming after World War One and into World War Two. With that, is there enough of a deflection far enough back here that you create a different you create a different culture that may have produced a different scenario that 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 plays forward with a much different impact. I mean, the culture is going to be a little bit different. I don't think it's going to be different enough. I think the Northern part of Japan gets even more entrenched in it. And it was entrenched. You you lose on some level. Yamamoto at the world war two level was a, this is going to sound odd to say, but he was a moderating force to an extent. Because he had a uh, he had an affinity for the West. Yeah, well, and, and he and, knew, and a whole and generation, I, whole generation, of, particularly the Japanese naval officers, had studied right uh, going to the West, and so they were influenced by what they brought back with them. And again, you, it, it, to me, it's that ultimate question, which is hard to answer: is which which culture or society influences the other more? Uh, to, and and you know I think Eric hit on Robert hit on it's probably going to be the same just because there's there's enough of a critical mass there for what was already um, from a Japanese religious and cultural standpoint enough of it's still intact and again we're talking about one island here that may be taking a different path you know going down the road mm-hmm. as well. Well, may I share with you guys where the name change comes from? Sure. Yeah. So the Portuguese were told by the Chinese that there was an island which they called Shipan, which was their attempt at pronouncing Nihon. And it roughly equivalent, we call it land of the rising sun, but it, a more specific one and a little less refined is origin of the sub. Now, perhaps in a hundred years, what instead it'll be land of the risen sun, not land of the rising sun. Hey, we just had a Star Trek call out there to a Star a Star Trek original series episode where uh, uh, bread and circuses, man. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Fine. Well, that's that's a very uh, I think that was a, that was a very good vision of uh, of what it could be, Eric. So thank you for that, and thank I you for the quiz. I didn't I didn't know that. I didn't come into this knowing that there was going to be a quiz, but I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Even though I didn't do that great, I still really enjoyed it. <laughs> so nicely done. Yeah. Uh, any, any closing thoughts on this before we, we round out this this subject? Again, it's um, we're, we're going to come more to this part of the world because we've just committed to come more to this part of the world in this time in history because we we underrepresent it in terms of its significance and importance. Even coming down, as, as we're talking about here, the 20th century and 21st century, uh, the there's there's a reason those cultures were what, what they were by the time you know there's more of a clash between east and west. Robert, any thoughts that, that we missed from you? No, I, I think we. I, I do think you do get the dichotomy, and I think that northern Japan, because of this, becomes even more entrenched. Yeah. I think I think that the that's a that's a long term visit. I think from a from for another episode at some point. Yeah, the, the other thing that jumped out at me that was along those lines is as I was reading some of the background material, that after this, this is a major civil war. Over a mm-hmm. hundred thousand die. Um, there's a period of up until the uh until you know the mid-19th century, there's there's a long period of pro of, of peaceful of peace internally. Uh this was one of those, you know, there was not a desire inside of Japan to revisit this type of this level and, and amount of death, you know, that did influence history for the next couple of years. So you know. The next couple of centuries, rather. So, to to Eric's fork, if you have fewer, you know, if you have less of that, you know, is somebody more willing to to do whatever is there? And and is there a change to the, you know, at what point does feudalism in Japan go away? It is to me the other question that we didn't even explore that you know that comes into play because it it endured there much longer than it did in Europe for all kinds of reasons. The isolation being part of it, mm-hmm. being the major part of it. So. Eric Rush, miss anything from your perspective that you're just dying to say about this one? 
No, no, I think this, uh, I think we've got a pretty, pretty tight potential timeline here. This is great. Okay. Lex? Uh, just to kind of echo Robert's point, I think uh, Northern Japan would go much more insular. Um, so I'm, and I think we've set up uh, some potential further episodes to explore in this area of the world with kind of the aftermath and the falling out of this. Also, I have to tell a quick story. When Eric did the roll the dice thing and we all ended up as parent peasants, dad, I don't know if you remember when we went and saw the Magna Carta when it came to Houston and they had the quiz where you could find out what you were going to be in medieval England, it would have been. And there was a little kid, must have been like seven, in front of my dad because my dad was going to do the quiz. And he's like, he got very exasperated. He goes, no matter what I do, I end up as a peasant. <laughs> <laughs> and so my dad went to do the quiz. And I don't know if you remember this again, but it was it was basic questions. It was like, can you read? Can you write? You know, do my dad intentionally did like, can I read? No. Can I write? No. And he ended up as like a lord. <laughs> so when we did that I just had that running through my head the whole time <laughs> I thought I would throw it in but no uh I think this is a really good one so thanks right. Eric for putting it together it was yeah. good yep th thanks for th th thanks for challenging us and just because Alexis and I got the best score doesn't mean that's why we liked the format better than anybody else did. <laughs> oh, no, it's all good. It's, it's, yeah you, you know what you earned it you guys yeah. earned it <laughs> I, I just I, I took wild guesses or followed my daughter, which you know is is, is worked pretty well for me in most of my life. So there you go. And podcast recommendation: check out Lore by Aaron Minky because I'm there pretty you. sure that's how I got that one answer. <laughs> <laughs> there, there you go. All right, we're going to close this episode out. Uh, again, thanks for joining us, guys. We we know it's been a while, so we hope that you found us back here. We hope that we're still in your in your subscribe and download feed. And you, oh, here's a new fork in time. How'd that happen? Because it's been a little bit of a, of a while. We're we're gonna should be able to get back back on the horse and get more consistent here now that we're in a new year and and past the holidays as well. I don't remember if I mentioned this in another episode or if I just mentioned it perhaps on our Discord server, which, by the way, I recommend that you check check out. Also check out the website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Uh, but those of you may remember Dylan Holzmer, who's joined us for a couple of episodes, most notably with me. I had the privilege of doing a uh, the What If Elvis Had Lived episode, which was, you know, sometimes when we talk about the other type of history, we sometimes call our little uh, – our, our, our pop type of hits. Uh, Dylan's going to be joining our team on a regular basis. I'm looking forward to what Dylan brings and uh, he will definitely join the uh, barbecue discussion. We know very well because he's from Memphis and he, he comes with an attitude about that. So we will continue to have the great barbecue schism inside the team here, but that's okay. We're going to continue to support it. So on behalf of Alexis, uh, Eric DB, Eric Rush, and Robert Koshu, we just want to say thanks again from a fork in time. Hope that you join us next time. Thanks. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash aforkintime. We hope you will join us next time.